Thank you for choosing this podcast. This is a working class production. What's up, guys? Hey, hey, hey. Hey. So it's Aaron and Alicia, and we are two, two elephants, elephants in, in the room. room. And we are coming to you this morning from a very, very hip and trendy restaurant. <laughs> Cafe. Cafe, yeah. Um, Coco and the director. This place is super cute. It is um, uptown off of East Trade Street. In Charlotte, North Here Carolina. in Charlotte. Yeah. Um, they have like cute little um, coffee and tea and little sitting areas. It's um, real in, it's got a real industrial vibe, but mm-hmm. it's also very warm. Like I Yeah, it's really really nice. Um so how are you doing this week, Alicia? You know, I can't complain. I'm so damn glad it's Friday. I don't know what to do. <laughs> you and me both. Oh my gosh, this week has been It it's, has been a week. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> it's been a week. Um yeah. Aaron and I are both drinking warm drinks with yes. the change in weather so excuse our deepness of voices <laughs> yeah the voice the voice the tone is struggling this morning but yeah. that's okay because we are so glad to be here to talk with you guys about just a couple things that's been going on this week mm-hmm. um and just to continue to let you get to know who we are as we um move forward with our podcast um yeah so <laughs> This week, and I, I'm not up on the news like I should be, but I have heard like on NPR and things like that about the um, Dylan Roof case, mm-hmm. and that he was found guilty. Um, and so I think you know a little bit more about this, right, Alicia? I, I don't know if I know a little bit more, but I, I definitely have some <laughs> opinions about yeah. it. Um, you know, it's been it's been a very interesting 2016 for sure for um you know for the people for for minorities um I think that each time someone uh gets away with a senseless murder we get pretty incised time and time um, again time and time again and you know it's interesting because one of the things my grandma said you know they've been killing us for years it's just that it's uh right now it's kind of on front street um, we, Aaron and I are, you know, right down the road from Charleston. And I hate to even say that I still haven't been there. Oh, wow. Um, I want to take a weekend drive there. But just this idea that you can't even um, sit and pray yeah. without feeling like uh, you have to be on edge. And, yeah, on and, guard. And, and or on that, guard. that you're not going to be able to finish the service or whatever. Yeah. That's insane. Um, and I think it's one of those things where... We, we we have to be I feel like I'm I'm more mindful. I feel like I'm more hyper vigilant. Oh for sure. Um, everywhere. Everywhere I am. And I you know, I'm concerned. I'm concerned that you gotta be careful when you get out of your car, when yeah. you're going into the gas station, when you're walking down the street, when you're reading a book. You know what I mean? So it's 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 difficult times and um you know, I did this poem a little while ago and I in in a line in the poem was just like, you know, for those of you who think race or racism doesn't exist like you're living in in your own fairy tale yeah you got to be in a bubble to think that these real real things are not happening it's like you can have all the evidence and still it'll be on film you know i mean this one in particular Mm -hmm. was not on film i don't believe but Mm -mm. you know other situations other um murders have been on film and you know they'll be like eh there's still doubt. There's still yeah. space to say maybe it wasn't what we see. It's yeah. like you go you're not even gonna believe your own eyes. Right. It, it for gets. for to, to continue you living in your cloud of, you know, mm-hmm. racism. Like for and, real? And you know, how are we gonna tie this into mental health? It's this idea that um just vicarious trauma, you know, oh, this sure. idea that yeah. we it is a struggle for us to watch someone Mm -hmm. um get murdered in front of our eyes right yeah um it is it increases like i said our hyper vigilance um it increases our anxiety like i get anxious when i have black male friends or Mm -hmm. you know the guy that i'm dating i'm I'm anxious if he's out on the street or yeah um somebody's out late or you know it's it's just one of those things where it heavily impacts us and Mm -hmm. 
I can't remember if you and I were just talking or, you know, we Aaron and I also are part of this collective um, that is aimed at helping professionals that are um, helping other people impacted by just everything going on with race Racial and trauma, Charlotte. yeah. Um, just, just this trauma around it. Um, and I don't, I think we, we take too lightly, like, what it means to be um, impacted by racism um, and oppression and, and how it ties in with just the stigma. Yeah. I think sometimes it's so normal Mm -hmm. that you you have to like there are times when it's you know very just like vivid and in your face Mm -hmm. and then there's other times where it's so normalized that you have to work to see it um and some people refuse to do that and and i would say i'll be honest and say it's people of you know all races to who sometimes choose to be like nah that wasn't that yeah um that wasn't what we what you think it was Mm -hmm. um so it was a very interesting situation a couple of weekends ago. I was, or actually last weekend, I was, um, I went out with some friends to the Santa Bar, the Santa Bar crawl. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it was me and two other black women and we're just hanging and chatting, having a great time. And these three guys in pink bunny costumes come up. And so one of the girls I was with, she, or women I was with, she's um, getting ready to go to law school. Mm-hmm. And so she's talking with one of the guys and, um, and white men and, you know, he's like, so what do you do? And she was like, oh, I'm getting ready to go to law school. And he was like, that's interesting. And so for me, naturally, my thought was, I didn't think there was any, I didn't think anything to it, but she took it as, oh, for real, like, it's got to be interesting that I, you know, I'm going to law school. And so I think the other piece to this is that whenever we experience racism, how it impacts us personally Mm -hmm. um, is based a lot upon what we're seeing every day and, and, and what we're feeling every day. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's just, a, it's a really, I don't know. It's a spectrum. Cause it's like, well, how do you say this is, or this isn't, you know, racial right. trauma. But right. I think too, um, it's difficult for those of us who grew up, um, not as impacted or affected by race. So, True. so for example, for a long time, race wasn't a thing mm-hmm. for me, you mm-hmm. know, it wasn't introduced in that way because I grew up in between a small town with my grandma and then on a military base with my mother. True. So on a military base, you are defined by your rank, uh-huh. right? Um, that's how we define status on a military base. So everyone was a family. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It wasn't this divide or this constant thing. And then growing up at my grandma's, it was a small town and it was only black and white. Mm. Um, and that's just what it was. Yeah. So it wasn't until, for me, I don't think until like maybe later on in high school, early college, that, like, I was as impacted or affected by race. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And I think a part of it really led to, like, where I am today as a therapist Mm -hmm. um, because I view everybody as as human first. You know what I mean? And I'm Mm -hmm. I'm really big on this campaign around, like, we're human. If you you slice me open and you slice the next person open, like, we have red blood. You know what Mm -hmm. I mean? Um... I think that racially, race is socially constructed. Oh, for sure. Um, for and I, sure. And I talk about that a lot about, unfortunately, because of um, history and, and where we've evolved and what we've come from, there are certain things that are going to get underneath our skin. Yeah. There are certain things that are going to bother us. Um, and some of us feel like we have to work three, four times harder. Um, yeah than the next person. And I agree with you that is a social construct, but I think the fact that it has been socially constructed to keep people divided that way, mm-hmm. like it's, it, you can't ignore the fact that it is a, a, an actual like mm-hmm. phenomenon. Like it is a thing mm-hmm. that is, that is pervasive in our, in our worldview and our experience mm-hmm. um, day to day. But it was interesting because you were saying like the first time you kind of, you really um, experienced racism was in high school, but mm-hmm. for me it was third grade. Mm. And I remember the exact moment because, you know, I grew up in a very small town Mm -hmm. where it we had I had no black neighbors. I've never actually lived in a neighborhood where there was other black people there Mm -hmm. Um, or at least my age. Anyway, I think there was one time there was like one older black guy, but he was around the way. So Mm -hmm. anyway, um, when I was in third grade, my mother was my teacher and um, one of the girls in the class, a white girl, was having a birthday party, and she invited all of the white girls in the class to her party and me. Mm -hmm. And my mom wouldn't let me go 
Um, and so it was just this weird, like, why can't I go? Because right. I knew she lived in um, a gated community, a really right. nice house. You know, I was like, I want to go. I want to, you know. Um, but my mom was like, nah. Because hmm. she knew that I was only being invited because I was the teacher's daughter, mm -hmm. not because of any, because I wasn't particularly close with this little girl. I right. just wanted to go because <laughs> it's a party. Right. It's a sleepover. Right. Um, but I do remember recognizing the difference at, in that time whenever mm -hmm. I wasn't allowed to go to that party. So just very, very interesting. Um, very interesting experiences that kind of shape our worldview as we mm -hmm. move forward and get older. And I don't even remember. I mean, you know, like I said in, a, in our first episode, I went to a predominantly white school and then a historically black school. So mm -hmm. that was yeah different you know what i mean that was two different perspectives but um i can't think of you know when i was out in los angeles last year around um it had to have been around like breast cancer awareness i was doing a shoot with one of my homeboys bafo and um we were in hollywood it was like early sunday morning and um he a guy, oh, a white guy drove by and was like, you niggers need to get in the house. Oh, wow. Um, and this was like October 2015, and we weren't, <laughs> like, doing any graffiti. Like, yeah. we, you know, we were out there doing a, a, a photo shoot yeah. around breast cancer. Um, and I was like, wow. And it's times like that that I'm reminded. Yeah. Um, you got to be careful, man. You got to be safe. And unfortunately, we can't control just the ignorance of other people yeah yeah and and i'll say like i feel like ever since you know donald trump has been on his 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 little on his campaign now mm -hmm. that he is the president-elect like mm -hmm. i definitely you know you were talking about just being more hyper vigilant mm -hmm. and more aware and paying closer attention to your surroundings and even mm -hmm. sometimes feeling like you know even the i mean I don't want to be the person that thinks that all police officers are bad. At the same time, I feel like they all have the potential <laughs> to just not be fair. And so it, it's just every time I see somebody pulled over, I'm like, you know, I, I'm following them with my eyes. And I'm probably one of those people that other people hate because I'm slowing down and I'm not going as fast as I should be just to kind of keep traffic moving. But it's just all these different things mm -hmm. um, that are just changing. Mm -hmm. Things are changing. Yeah, as we've had a, a guy come into into office mm -hmm. who is just very outright about his disdain for different groups of people. Right. And it's not just, you know, black and white. It is across the board, across the board. With, <laughs> with people <clears throat> who, I, yeah. So Ann, a little bit, a, a little bit, a little more about Aaron and I. We both work for the same agency yes. um, here in Charlotte. And I'm not sure if you know this, but one of our offices in Gastonia. Mm hmm which is a more rural area. Yeah. Um, you know, there's some Confederate flags. There's some Trump <laughs> signs. Um, there's been a lot of issues for the therapists out there because they're oh, going wow. into these homes and people are like, I don't want no niggas in my home. Oh, wow. Um, I don't want no niggas telling me what to do. You're not going to tell me how to run my life. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the things that, you know, I, and I'm, I briefly mentioned this earlier that I'm very passionate about is this idea of um, compassion fatigue, this yeah. idea of burnout, this, this idea of... Um, us as helping people, we have to take care of ourselves mm -hmm. um, so we can help other people. For sure. Um, so just to hear them say, like, you know, we, we only want to help and, and to get that type of response, mm -hmm. um, it's tough. You know yeah. what I mean? It's tough. And I, uh, this idea, again, of us as a people being resilient, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And, and what that looks like for us to... Um, be able to endure during these times. And then what about for the people who like, you know what? I'm tired. Yeah. I'm tired of fighting yeah. this battle. I'm tired of, of trying to prove myself, you know. Yeah. Cause I didn't know, I didn't know that about the Gastonia office, but where I came from, which is a smaller town called Hickory is, mm -hmm. you know, it's on the way between here and there. Um, Gastonia is on the way between here and Charlotte, mm -hmm. there in Charlotte. And so, um, but I remember having, you know, experiences with, clients myself who you know their parents would make comments about me and um ex express that they didn't feel like I was 
qualified to mm-hmm. do the job and um it was very racial you know heavy racial undertones mm-hmm. sometimes overtones but i remember going to a staffing um with other therapists and really needing to just kind of have them understand my position mm-hmm. and at that time and help me figure out how to do some self-care because I worked in an environment that was not as diverse. Yeah. Um, which is something that I am grateful for about the agency that we work with now. Right. But I worked in an, in a, in a agency that was not as diverse. And so their whole response to me was use it as a teachable moment for the client. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I'm not trying to like, this is about me, but right. they couldn't transition to, to talking about how to help me. It mm-hmm. was just, Oh, well you can teach the client that racism is bad, <laughs> you know, or, and I was just like, in the moment, I did just because I'm I had professional. <laughs> but at the same time, like, after I come out of that, I, as therapists, we have to, my, my professor used to call it, take a take an emotional shower. Yeah. You know, we have to. I like that. We have to kind of take, because when you're in a room with someone who's burying their soul or just talking mm-hmm. about whatever, like, that stuff is, it stays in your brain. Mm-hmm. And so you have to figure out how to declutter and just kind of cleanse your, your mind so that you aren't carrying that around all day. Because you will go, <laughs> you will just, I don't know, you won't know how to handle life if you're carrying the experiences the of stuff. other people all the time. And I guess that, that emotional shower is synonymous with decompression. True. Um, yes. Which I, you know, even my friends who are not therapists, I taught them like, you need to go home and decompress. What yeah. is that? <laughs> <laughs> it's whatever you whatever you make it to where you are letting go of the things of the day. Yes. You are having some quiet time. You are having some downtime yeah. to really release. Um, because if you don't, we will carry with us. Oh, for sure. And it and all it does is is just pile up. Mm-hmm. But I wanted to I wanted to speak I wanted to play devil's advocate to what we're talking about today because I too, nice. you know, one of my best friends is half white. Mm-hmm. Um, and I also have a good friend here who was raised um, in homes with white parents. Mm-hmm. Um, and for <laughs> them and for, for us who have close friends that are white, like, mm-hmm. You can't. You. It's difficult to group them all in the same category. Absolutely. To say and that is that they're yeah. all bad. Yeah, that is a mental all struggle yeah. all the time, all the time. Um, and I, there's even some cognitive dissonance about that because mm-hmm. you try to have the conversation and you can't go through and say, well, this one, this one, not that one, but this one and this one, and mm-hmm. not that one, not those, but this one. Like these are the ones who are racist. These are the ones who are bad. Mm-hmm. You can't. You can't do that in a conversation. I think we use general tones, which is. It makes it easy to have the conversation, mm-hmm. um, but it also makes it difficult to be balanced and honest and fair and authentic in what the true experience is. Because you're you're right, it's it's not everyone, mm-hmm. and I think more than not, it you know, more times than not, people are good. Yeah, people are not thinking you know with such um, malice. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The other side of it, though, is I think that there's a there's an aspect to white privilege where they get to not notice things Mm -hmm. and to not um not really deal with things Mm -hmm. and so even that is like a slight you know it's 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 a slight form of racism so very interesting i saw a video on Mm -hmm. facebook where they went and talked to um white liberals who Mm -hmm. you know felt like they were doing the good thing and and wanted to really be helpful and proactive and so they were saying things like you know African Americans tend to live in areas that are far away from, you know, um, like the DMV. They don't have IDs. They may not have internet connection. They may not have all these things. And so then, and I think this was actually in New York where they did these interviews, these mm-hmm. street interviews. Mm-hmm. But then they found black people and they were like, do you have ID? And they were like, yeah, I always have ID. Do right. you have internet connection? <laughs> she was like, I got an unlimited plan on my phone. Right. You know, do you know where the DMV is? Yeah, it's on 120, 125th Street. Right. And they were able to, get, you know, and so it was just like, the black people they were like why would anybody think that we don't have access to these things why would anybody think that we don't know what these things are and so even these white liberals who thought that they were being open-minded and really thinking about um the world as a whole and Mm -hmm. and 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 would maybe even consider themselves distance distant from racism Mm -hmm. they were still in their cloud Mm -hmm. their, their 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 mental cloud of following what they see on TV or mm-hmm. media or here in the radio or whatever assumptions that they have. But it's, I think too, so I do have a lot of opinions about uh, <laughs> privilege, uh, which 
I'm trying to filter out in my head what I'll say. But yeah. one of the things I will say about there is this idea of we cannot all see the things that are not in our immediate reach. True. So, for Very example, true. when I the first time I went to South Africa back in 2000 and something, um, I, I found it so interesting that um, – there were this there were these areas of extreme poverty mm -hmm. versus these areas of extreme fortune and mm -hmm. when you talk to each other they had no idea about the, the other experience end. you yeah. know what i mean uh -huh. the same thing when i lived in new york you know mm -hmm. i worked in east new york which is a, a small um, impoverished community in brooklyn mm -hmm. um and my some of my clients there had never been to the bronx which mm -hmm. is on the other side they had never taken the train through manhattan up through harlem to the bronx you know what i mean mm -hmm. um and even in la you know in la there's skid row yeah so i would go me and my my friends will go out, skid row, volunteer, go down there, yeah. hand out stuff or whatever. But there are people in like East Hollywood, for, or not East Hollywood, West Hollywood, yeah, WeHo, West Hollywood. <laughs> yeah. um, who never been, they don't go down there. Yeah. You know what I mean? Or, you know, going to school in Richmond, I mm -hmm. was so upset for the longest time because the bus didn't go to Short Pump. So mm -hmm. in Richmond, you know, downtown Richmond was a little more impoverished or whatever and short mm -hmm. pump is where the nice mall is and i said well why the hell don't doesn't the bus go up to short pump yeah. so it's this idea that while some of us are are entitled there are also people who cannot step outside of their immediate reach so if it does not True. if it does not touch me mm -hmm. i don't know anything about it i don't have a desire to yeah. learn about it because it doesn't affect me you know what i mean exactly and that's and that's I think that goes all the way up to this two percent system where two percent of the nation is wealthy yes. um they are exempt from taxes, right, because yeah. of the amount of money that they make. So they, they're not affected in the same way as the working class mm -hmm. um, who is heavily taxed. You know yeah. what I mean? And it's because it's not it's not within their reach. Now, yes. you do have some people who came from nothing. Yes. And became something. Mm -hmm. And it's different for them. Right. Mm -hmm. So they may be a little more connected. Yeah. Um, but for some people who have for their entire life and, you know, this even go, this even makes me think of recidivism. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you know, I've had clients before that their parents and their grandparents and their great grandparents didn't work and were on food stamps. Mm -hmm. So that is what they knew. Yeah. That it became it, it, it is ingrained in them. Yeah. Right? Um, so then I come along and I'm trying to. You know, we're trying to explain, like, why don't you want to work? Why don't yeah, you wanna, you yeah. Know what I mean? But that is what they knew. Yeah. So I, I, I too, think that while there are some people who are um, privileged and, and, and entitled, which mm -hmm. I cannot stand entitled people, but um, <laughs> there are also some people who, you know, it ain't never been a part of my world. Yeah. And I don't want to see outside of my world. Mm -hmm. um, and can we fault them? You guys I, can't see us, but we both yeah. just shrugged. Yeah, oh, I forgot. <laughs> like, <laughs> We're not videotaping. You know. But yes, and I think, but but that's the thing. It's like Google is there for everyone. This is true. And so you have access to all kinds of knowledge this is all true. the time. And so what's the balance? What's the balance whenever we're having these? And this is why it causes so much like cognitive dissonance Absolutely. and just fr you know frustration and not wanting to generalize across the board. But mm -hmm. at the same time, how else do you have the conversation? But you know what, Aaron, you and I talked about, and I talked about this um, with my guy friend too. You know, there are some of us who walk around in a state of obliviousness. True. You know, and 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 not even to be funny. You know, every T-shirt is about being woke, and everything's about you know, yeah, I'm woke, stay woke, be awake. But there really are people who walk around in their own realities. Yes. Um, because it's comfortable. That is true. So think about why. So as a human, we don't we don't want to experience discomfort. We do not want to we challenge. We don't want to be yeah, embarrassed. Ourselves. Yeah, we don't yeah. want to be ashamed. We don't want to be humiliated, right? So mm -hmm. we got to think about the people who have lived in this, lived in their bubble. The bubble is is fucking safe. Yeah. Like the bubble is bulletproof. It is. I ain't stepping outside that bubble, right? Yeah. But then some of us want to burst the bubble actively and seek new out bubbles and, yeah. and you know what i mean so there is i think for some of us there is this balance mm -hmm. but for other people they're like hey i'm safe and i'm staying yeah. safe in this in this world that i've created well and when you were talking about that i was thinking about myself because this year i took several trips either out of the state or out of the country but everywhere i went it was a goal to try to do some kind of like community service mm -hmm. public something um and the first trip i took was to la mm -hmm. one of your former hometowns or Mm -hmm. places you lived 
<clears throat> and um, me and my really, really good friend from sixth grade, mm-hmm. you know, I went to stay with her for a week and we went down. I don't think it was on Skid Row, but we went down to a church and handed out breakfast um, to people. But I have I really appreciate her and her like in in ways that I don't even know that she knows because she's white, mm-hmm. but she will send me a random text message. I hope you're feeling strong today. I hope you recognize, like, I hope you feel confident. I hope, mm-hmm. you know, and she, whenever I was moving from Hickory to Charlotte, like, she just randomly made me a, a self-care package, her mm-hmm. and her sister. You know, and so I, again, it goes back to this cognitive distance that I have when I make generalized statements mm-hmm. about groups of people because it is not true for everyone. And exactly. there are people who challenge themselves. And it's interesting because she will say, you know, I see these things and I'm experiencing these experiencing these things mm-hmm. but you know it's coming from my white mind and you know my and, and it's just it's really um refreshing to hear her absolutely um be able to kind of point those things out and i've made new friends with people that i haven't known quite as long right. who do the exact same thing mm-hmm. um the other side of that is that every, in my everyday life like i could be um there was one day i was driving to Mm chick-fil-a oh i don't even know if we can say names of places but i was driving to get something to eat (laughs) and i'm sitting in my car because i'm always jamming to music so i'm dancing in my car putting on a concert if you will Mm -hmm. and these guys in this truck and this was in my hometown but these guys in this truck come up and they're like blowing the horn and pointing their fingers at me and making these faces and there's a huge confederate flag on the back and so it's like how do i balance this experience with these guys but what i know with my friends Mm -hmm. how like where what do you say that encompasses all of it Mm -hmm. i don't know that that i don't know that that language has been created yet and i think too you you are bringing up something about um perspective yes in 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 how things are situational yeah so there are in certain in certain situations we have to govern ourselves one way and Mm -hmm. in other situations we have to govern ourselves in another way and and what does that mean for us now for some people who work in the corporate world they call it code switching yes you know which we can talk about um on another episode but this idea that like how can we be our authentic self Mm. in every situation staying safe and staying aware oh my god you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, what does that mean for us? And I pride yeah. myself on being genuine and being authentic yes. and, 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 and presenting who I am in every con like every environment that I'm in. I really yeah. pride myself on on staying true to myself. Mm-hmm. But like how difficult is it in situations like that? Especially if you've been in a bubble and yeah. you don't have to. And you, and it's un- and you and you fight that discomfort of, mm-hmm. of challenging yourself and trying to be. Yeah. Oh wow, that's 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 good. Yeah, that's real good. Yeah, um, so I do want to just highlight something that's happening in um, Charlotte for those who are interested. There is a um, uh, race matters for juvenile justice. Um, they're doing some just different um, community presentations here in Charlotte, and the next one uh, it's called dismantling racism workshop Mm -hmm. um and the next one that they have coming up is january 5th day after Uh my birthday um so if you are interested in looking that up the website is um rmjj.org um and again and that's race matters for juvenile justice um and then you know my tip one of my tips is to um take these social media breaks yeah so it is um very easy and you know I, I joke with one of my homeboys about this because he's always battling somebody on Facebook <laughs> rant. Um, it is very easy to get um, sucked in mm-hmm. you know sucked into all the all the things that people have to say on, on social media um, I am a I have a love-hate relationship yeah. um, with social media I don't ha- I don't have Twitter because I don't care about other people's opinions um, <laughs> oh, God. I, I don't you know what I mean but I also catch myself and I and I'm reminding people to take those breaks so I don't get caught up comparing myself to other people's journey and, yeah. and I'm not there. Or I don't know yeah. what they had to sacrifice to get there. So my tip really is to take 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 some social media breaks and do something for you. You know, yeah. get active, visit a friend, engage in a new project, like do something 
for you, um, especially when you feel yourself getting just sucked into the social media madness. For sure. And one of the things that I remember you saying the other day is that you do everything to protect your peace. Absolutely. And I, you know, I am one of those people who I enjoy social media mm-hmm. and I definitely engage. Um, but there will be times when I'll make a, a, a status or a statement um, that may be loaded in mm-hmm. whatever way politics Mm -hmm. um social justice racism whatever but there will also be times when i'll finish it with you know hey if you need to just you know protect your peace if you need to kind of step away from this like it's cool you don't got to respond or you we don't have to Mm -hmm. agree uh, but just do what you need to do to take care of you right Uh, i'm just putting my thoughts and feelings out there absolutely Um, but i love the 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 phrase that you said protecting your peace because i feel like that is um of utmost importance because Again, social media is fun, and mm-hmm. we all enjoy it. Well, most of us, <laughs> at least, does not, not me, all the but time. I, I get but it. we enjoy it. Um, but at the same time, like we can't let it over overcome us and, mm-hmm. and be so involved that we're not um, protecting our peace, keeping our minds safe, and mm-hmm. um, doing the things that help us be better people and to help us grow. So, and I just, I don't even know. I can't even remember if that protecting my peace came from. I know I've been thinking like that, like, before mm-hmm. I was a therapist. Mm-hmm. Just, like, yeah, I think as humans, like, we can only take in so much. For sure. You know what I mean? For and sure. I've been asking people recently, like, how much can our brain, <laughs> how much can our brain store? <laughs> like, yeah. how much love can our heart take in? You know what I mean? Yeah. So I'm, I'm so, um, I'm so fascinated by humans, right? I'm mm-hmm. so fascinated about the things that we can do and in, in our capabilities. But yeah. at the same time, like, I recognize how fragile we are. For sure. So while we have great power, like, we are fragile. And, yeah, you, yeah. you guys you guys out there in the, is this the listening world? Internet yes, world? the podcast world. The podcast world. Um, protect your damn peace, man. Please, please. Protect your peace. It is of the utmost importance. Mm-hmm. And so... We are going to leave you with those thoughts. We want you to protect your peace and, um, you know, just make sure that you are being authentic to yourself. Yeah. And, um, and seeing people as humans first. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. Um, and challenge your, challenge your own thoughts. Mm-hmm. You know, it is a very uncomfortable process, but if you can just find ways to, to challenge what comes naturally to your mind, I think, um, we can all make necessary edits, you yep. know? And if you guys can comment below, tell us how you do protect your peace. Tell yes. us how you do, you know, um, find ways to engage people in different ways and how you challenge your mind. Absolutely. And, um, That'd be awesome. That would be great to get your feedback, okay? So thank you for joining us today. Thank you so we're much. We're so, so glad that you were able to spend this time with us. And uh, this is Aaron And Alicia. And we are two elephants in the room. Take care. Bye. <laughs>